morning, friends. So we're going to go over uh, Chapter 1, Emergency Medical Care and Procedures. Um, this is pretty much going to break down the different ways we do triage um, and the different uh, types of um, situations, whether it's like, you know, emergency or non-emergency, so depending on the situation. So a lot of these questions trip people up on the exams and try to differentiate, like, who do we say first versus who we just let sit there and die, right? So this instruction is coming straight from your Corman manual. So you can always go to chapter 21 in your Corman manual and you can find all this goodness. So some general first aid rules. One, you're gonna stop the bleeding and maintain circulation. Two, maintain breathing and airway. And three, prevent or treat for shock, right? So I used to be, back in the day, was ABCs, was what you wanted to do. Well, if your person's bleeding out, what's the point of trying to you know, get an airway and keep them breathing? So you wanna make sure you stop the bleeding uh, before you do anything else at least throw a tourniquet on and then try and get them breathing. All right, so triage is uh, the is to sort. That is always a question. What does triage mean? It means to sort. And it's the process of quickly assessing patients on a multi-casualty incident. So this is where you start seeing people with the tags on them, the green, yellow, red, and black mm -hmm. tags on them. That's the prioritizing who we're treating first versus who can wait a hot minute. All right, so there's two types of triage. There's non-tactical and tactical. So this is important because when you're reading your questions on the exam, it'll say in a non-tactical situation, how would you triage this patient? Or in a tactical situation, how would you triage this patient? Um, so as you can see, there's, there's some pretty minor differences, but it's still different enough that you have to kind of know what you're doing. All right, so for non-tactical triage, uh, we have our five priorities. So that's automatically one difference, right? For non-tactical, there's five priorities. Priority one is your immediate, your red. Uh, injuries are critical, but require minimal time or equipment to manage. Uh, example, it would be like a, comp a compromised airway, massive external hemorrhage, okay? Priority two is your delayed yellow, um, Injuries are debilitating, but treatment can be delayed to save life or limb. Example would be like a long bone fracture. So like a, like your, uh, a fracture in your leg or your arm, okay. Three is minor green. So these are your walking wounded. These are persons that you say, if you can hear the sound of my voice, get your ass up and walk towards me, right? So that's what that is. That means get up, you can help yourself, but they also can provide buddy care, right? So we teach our Marines buddy care so that way they can help us, right? Uh, four is your expectant injuries so severe that there is a minimal chance of survival. These are people we just cannot save. You look at them, you're like, call chaps, this is, sorry. And then priority five is your dead, that's your black, right? So, um, it's important to know these for many different reasons, but for exam purpose wise, is you need to understand that your priority one for non-tactical is your emerging. They need to go right now. These are your reds. But look at tactical triage. Your priority one is your minor. That's your walking wounded. That's your that's your uh, category three and non tactical. So make sure you're kind of looking at those and understanding the difference based off the situation. It usually will say on the exam, like in a non tactical situation, how would you prioritize? Or in a tactical situation. So it's not the same. So you gotta make sure we understand that. Priority two is your immediate. Um, it's your, for tactical triage, priority two is your immediate requires life-saving emergency surgery. Example is your upper airway obstruction, respiratory distress, tension pneumothorax, life-threatening bleeding, uh, decompensated shock. Priority three is your delayed. These are, uh, requires time-consuming surgery, but conditions can be delayed, right? So examples are your uh, compensated shock, heavy bleeding under control with tourniquet, injury that is uh, compromising circulation, penetration wounds, that is not uh, compromising airway breathing. And then of course your last for tactical triage is your four, which is your expectant. These are people that are going to die. We're gonna black tag them, move on life. So with non-tactical, if you look at priority one and priority two, and they match priority two and priority three for uh, tactical. Right. And then priority four for non-tactical is the same as tactical. So if you just move priority three up, mm -hmm. everything 
thing is in the like if you move right. that above priority one on non-tactical, right? It mirrors the same thing. Yes. So we just gotta make sure that we are understanding that in the different situations yeah. that our non-tactical triage is going to lay out slightly different. Right. So like I said on the exam, when you're reading these questions, make sure you're looking for those key words, you know, tactical versus non-tactical. Okay. After that. All right, so our airway. So we gotta maintain airway management, right? Yep. Okay. If you can't breathe, your think your organs start shutting down. Your your body requires oxygen. Your brain requires oxygen. If your brain don't get oxygen, it starts to shut down. If that starts shutting down, guess what else starts to shut down? The rest yes. of your body. All right. So if our patient requires any type of suctioning, we're gonna use a rigid tip to suction. You're gonna send as far as you can, as uh, far as you can see it but you're also not gonna suction more than 15 seconds at a time. So every 15 seconds, you're not you're, you're gonna stop suctioning. Good morning. Your oropharyngeal airway, we do not use those for a conscious patient. If you're trying to shove an airway in your patient's mouth when they are awake, they will throw up all over you and probably resist and fight. So the opposite of using an air, air, oropharyngeal airway is your nasopharyngeal airway, right? So we talked about it yesterday with um, H1. You're gonna measure for the oral pharyngeal, you're gonna measure from the corner of the mouth to the ear. If oral airway is difficult to insert, use gauze to pull the tongue toward uh, forward or a tongue depressor to de decompress the tongue. So you wanna make sure you're able to see the, the back of the throat and get that airway in. And if you're nasal pharyngeal airway, you're gonna pretty much do the, the measure, you're gonna measure from the you know, nose to ear right? Do not use petroleum or non-water-based lubricants when you're inserting it. Never force a nasopharyngeal airway. If an obstruction is felt, remove and rotate or try the other nostril. And most nasopharyngeal airways are designed for right nostrils, right? And you also insert with the bevel up. So as you're inserting it is when you start to turn it down to kind of rotate it, right? Um, let's see here. Is you are going to insert until black rings are against patient's teeth. You're going to inflate blue and cut a uh, blue and white cup. So that's another type of airway you want to use. Crikes. So crikes are used for emergency situation. Um, if there's a total upper, air, upper airway obstruction, um, inhalation burns, or massive maxillofacial trauma, so if somebody's face is missing, they've inhaled a lot of smoke, they got the black soot in the back of their mouth, whatever that's when you're going to use a crate, right? Not fun to do. Yes, I think they're fun to do. I've right. done it once. So, you know, you gotta feel for your crate membrane by feeling for a thyroid cartilage or Adam's apple and sliding fingers down to uh, cricoid cartilage. You're gonna cut uh, one fifth inch vertical incision into your cricoid membrane, use a hook needle and you're gonna insert it, ET tube, call it a day. Needle D's. Um, so the most important thing you need about needle D's is that they're used for pneumothorax or tension pneumothorax. Um, you want to stick at the second intercostal space at mid-clavicular line, so you can find your clavicle, patient clavicle, go down two intercostal spaces, that's where you're going to go. Um, you're going to use a large bore needle, so a 3.25 inch 14 gauge needle catheter. That's the question, they're like, what type of needle do you use for needle decompression? The biggest one they got on there. So if, there, if your options are 20, 18, 16, 14, do not pick 20, because you would be wrong. It's 14, 14 gauge, you know, just stab it in there. Just pull the thing out and you're pssst. You know you did the right thing. All right, so our shocks. We have different types of shock um, that our body goes through during different, for whatever reason. So hypovolemic shock, um, you have lost a lot of blood volume. A uh, patient could be cool, clean, and pale, uh, cyanotic skin, low blood pressure, all, um, altered consciousness. So how can you tell if your patient has a low blood pressure if you don't have a blood pressure cuff? Yeah, so there, sure, there can be visual signs, but what if I was like, I need to check to see if my patient has a pulse. How would I tell if my patient's blood pressure is low? So as, okay, yeah. boom, I'm gonna acknowledge y'all. So, each different pulse that we can check, you got your radial, brachial, parotid, and then your extremities, right? So it's 90, 60, and like 50.
50, I believe. So it'd be like 50 over pal. So the closer to the heart you get, the less amount of pressure buying needs to push out, right? So if you're feeling for pulses, you don't feel any pulse in their feet, okay, let's try their wrist. If you don't feel a pulse in the wrist, okay, let's try the brachial. If you're not feeling a brachial pulse and you're feeling a very faint coronal pulse, your blood pressure is extremely low, okay? So that's a quick and easy, dirty way to be like, okay, let's, I think my patient's blood pressure is low, even. So if you can't feel pulses in the extremities or further away from the heart, blood pressure is low, okay? Uh, distributive shock, also known as uh, vasogenic shock, is a vascular um, aliation, uh, vascular dilation without a pro pro proportional increase in blood volume. So when you hear people say they vaso out, they just like blood vessels open up and they just kind of pass out. It's similar to distribution shock. All right, um, neurogenic, septic shock, psychogenic shock, all result from distributive shock, all are categories of those. So neurogenic shock is your failure of your nervous system to control your blood vessels. Patients have warm, dry, pink skin. Septic shock usually takes about five to seven days. Um, cool, clammy, pale. Um, it's usually caused by a severe infection. So when you hear somebody's going septic, usually they end up trailing along to like a septic shock within those five to seven days. Psychogenic shock occurs through a uh, parasympathetic nervous system is generally brief. The patient will have cold, clammy, pale skin. Cardiogenic shock is a result of the heart failing to pump blood adequately. BP drops, consciousness, uh, altered mental status. Um, so the entrance and cause of that is your myocardial, like an MI, so a heart attack. Um, most common in men, 56 years old abnormal pulse, chest pain, shortness of breath, nausea and vomiting. Those are all great signs for men, but how can we tell a woman is having a heart attack? And so normally females will um, result having some type of like abdominal pain um, or back pain. They have like found studies that like women, instead of saying like, oh, they have chest pain, they relate more to like, they have a lot more abdominal pain um, they may have still have like, there are some signs of like the left shoulder pain down, radiating down their left arm. Um, so men are gonna be the ones where like, oh, my stomach hurt or my chest hurts. It's tight, clenching feeling. Where women may, may may more describe more like GI symptoms. My stomach hurts, like feel like I have heartburn, and that's where you're like, oh, let's get an EKG. Oh, you're having a heart attack. Um, some extrinsic, extrinsic causes for cardiogenic shock, tension pneumothorax, or chest trauma. Um, that's going to be your shortness of breath, dyspnea, tachycardia, cyanosis, jugular vein distension, so JVD. So if somebody's having a pneumothorax, what is happening um, is a lot of times you can depend the um, air buildup in the chest cavity, which is causing pneumothorax, can press against your heart, which is going to cause the heart not to be able to fully uh, pump and expand and as much as well so you get a build up of pressure and that build up of pressure is going to cause your jugular veins to get big. Right. So there's three stages of shock, incompensated, decompensated, and irreversible. So you're compensated uh, or non-progressive, uh, BP is maintained, narrowing pulse pressure, good chance of recovery with this treatment. So this, so if you've ever seen, there's like a, um, it's kind of like a, like a shelf kind of concept, right? So compensated, you're going all right, and then you kind of hit this like decompensated, uh, your progressive like plateau going on where BP is starting to fall, blood volume is uh, dropped 15 to 25%. Treatment sometimes can work and a patient can recover and go back, you know, to down to that baseline. But if they hit that irreversible, that's that downward trend that there is nothing we can do to help this patient. Right, the treatment normally doesn't result in recovery. Patient usually dies. So, if you start seeing your patient starting to like decompensate, that's when you not start like thinking like, what is going on? How can I fix this patient? What is happening? Do they need fluids? Do I need to elevate? To, like, what do I need to do to help my patient? Because once I hit that irreversible stage, there's nothing we can do. The brain can go four to six minutes without oxygen before permanent damage occurs. Death from massive hemorrhage can occur in two minutes. So that's why we need to stop the bleeding and then hit the airway. All right, there are uh, multiple stages of uh, shock. Um, your class one through four. Pretty much it's just 
uh, the amount of blood volume loss will increase. So class one, as you can see, 70, 750 milliliters or 50% of blood volume is lost. All the way up to class four, where you're losing about 40% of your blood volume, and that's where things get really dangerous. So as your patient's bleeding out and they're losing more and more blood, they're, they're starting to hit these different classifications. And um, it talks about like different, how heart rate may increase, pulse may become thready, respirations will uh, increase. Um, and then just from there, of course, if you think about it, if you're starting to lose a blood, blood volume, the more you lose, the worse you're gonna get, okay? Uh, so your cerebral vascular accidents, so these are your strokes. This is when a blood clot moves from your body to your brain, cause obstruction in your brain, which results in oxygen not being transferred and blood being transferred to your brain, which causes a stroke. Syncope is caused by is fainting. So for some reason, your patient's falling out. Uh, diabetic ketoacidosis is too much sugar in the blood, often mistaken for intoxication during the curves when a diabetic forgets to take their insulin or took too little. Um, and then insulin shock is too little. Two, the sugar in the blood is not as small. It can cause brain damage. Um, if I'm unsure whether your patient is in, has diabetic ketoacidosis or insulin shock, treat for insulin shock due to its deadliness. So if a patient is sugar is too low and they give themselves too much insulin, they're going to send themselves an insulin shock, and you'd rather give them treat with sugar cubes or oral glucose to help that because if too much insulin's in your body you can die right so we want to treat for that first and then if that's like not working then we go to our diabetic ketoacidosis and we're like oh shit we should probably do something all right injuries and meds so with brain injuries uh variation of pupil, pupil size can go for pupils to constrict so when you're doing your um Perla, pupils equal round reactive to light yep. combination. So you don't have the yeah. pupils don't move or one dilates and one doesn't. Like that's when you need to start being thing like some type of uh, brain injury, right? Um, you can also you know, do the, the halo test with the ears, put a tissue or something against the ear. And if there's a, that, that ring on your uh, tissue, whatever, you can definitely tie that. Or you have some leaking from your nose, patient's snow, nose. And just make sure you're not getting anything by mouth because at that point, they're probably not gonna be able to swallow. So let's not give our patients anything, but look for those very important signs for any type of brain injuries. Uh, so for our chest injuries, let's think about it, right? So if we are having any type of chest injury, we're probably gonna have problems breathing, right? Our chest is gonna hurt, we're not gonna be able to breathe. Um, there could be an airway obstruction, sucking chest wound, which is pretty serious. Um, you could also have failure of one side of the chest to rise enlarged vein, neck veins, tracheal deviation, which is a very late sign into the, the chest injury, and then uh, tachypnea, which is like heavy breathing. Um, so the term that you would need to look for for um, failure of one side of the chest to rise would be flail chest. So that's when they're breathing and one side's going like this and the other one's not moving at all. Okay, so flail well, chest, one portion of the chest fall, fails to rise. Look at that, it's so smart, it was right there. <laughs> All right, hemothorax is blood in the chest cavity, abdominal wounds, intense pain, nausea, vomiting, spasm of abdominal muscles. Do not apply pressure to the wound, right? So we are not going to try and put like a pressure bandage on there. So I believe what we're taught, you know, during TCCC, unless they changed it, is the taco method. If somebody has like oozing, like their uh, organs are sticking out, you put a pad under it, grab it, shh, nice and not snug, make sure it doesn't fall out. Um, so analgesics on the battlefield, combat carriers, if so able to fight, uh, the combat pill pack, which has Mobic and Tylenol, um, if able to fight, oral transmutical, uh, fentanyl, um, which is usually like a sucker, uh, some looks, looks like a sucker, tip to the hand, stick it in their mouth, and are like, all right, let's go. <laughs> um, so as Corbin, we carry morphine, uh, promethazine and moxifloxin, um, just as quick give and go kind of meds. So for morphine, the adult dose is 10 to 20 milligrams every four hours. Uh, respiratory depressed, um, it can cause respiratory, depress, respiratory depression, increase intracranial uh, pressure, it can cause uh, constriction of pupils, vasodilator, and mental confusion. 
and it is extremely addictive. So this is talking about uh, injuries and ways to treat them. <clears throat> um, hopefully we know the difference between a laceration, a puncture, yes. avulsion, and amputation. So we're not gonna really pretty much go over that and then just how to treat them, right? Um, I've seen uh, how long do you leave sutures in the face for? Four to five days. I, that was like one random question I've seen. Uh, pelvic fracture, do not move the patient unless absolutely necessary. Um, the, your pelvic cavity is extremely uh, vascularized. There's, you know, you have your big femoral arteries and veins in there, plus your a lot of like other smaller arteries and veins. So any type of uh, damage to the pelvis is uh, extremely big deal. So you don't want to move your patient without stabilizing their, their pelvis first if it's suspected. So that means biting something to put under them, tie it extremely tight. So that way they have that, that pelvic stabilization and then we need to throw out and move that patient. If you're suspecting some type of skull fracture, don't give your patient any medications because that's just a really bad idea. Yep. Okay. Looking for those uh, battle signs, bruising under the eyes, um, you know, like I said, unequal rise of, uh, reaction of the pupils, uh, cerebral spinal fluid may be leaking out the face somewhere, uh, complaint of headache, dizziness, things of that nature, all right. Um, joints, dislocations, um, do not attempt to reduce or put the joint back into a spot. You are not a doctor. Let the doctor do that. Never attempt to reduce serious dislocations. Example, like the femur, don't try and pop a femur back into place. Splint? Zero out of 10 recommend, yes. So we can splint, um, be resourceful if you can't. Anything that you can find that is able to stabilize any type of dislocation or fracture uh, in the body, please uh, use that. Um, difference between a sprain and a strain. Um, a sprain is injury to ligament and soft tissue that support a joint, and then your sprain is the tearing of a muscle or tendon. Burns, eyes, don't remove. If somebody has something impaled in their eyeball or in their body, do not remove it. Nope. Keep it there. Stabilize it with that, that four tail bandage if you can. I know the big, uh, you know, they say put a cup over the eyeball and at some point, one point in time they said don't put anything over the eyeball because whether your left eye moves, your right eye is gonna move with it. So if you're looking around, having your patient look around, they got things sticking out their eyeball, it's not gonna help anything. <laughs> Burns, your first, second, third degree burn, um, just know as the, the, your skin level, so your first degree burns, your epidermal layers burn, second degree is starting to get more down deeper into that dermal layers, and then your third degree is a full thickness burn. So your rules of nine, so this is, this is usually on there somewhere. Uh, so the rules of nine talks about like, what is it? So it's the, for the chart and the numbers per body part, um, can be a greater importance of evaluating serious burns. seriousness of the burns than the actual depth. Example, a first degree burn over 50% body more severe than a third degree burn over 5% body. So if we have a first degree burn that covers 50% of our body, so let's say it's like the front, back, uh, abdomen, lower back, both our arms, that's gonna be more severe than somebody that has just like a third degree burn to like their arm. So we're looking at more surface area versus severity. Now, if they got third degrees or 50% of the body, there's a problem. I'm, I'm afraid for you. Uh, treatment for burns, um, we're gonna remove the jewelry, we're gonna cover with dry sheet or dressing. You're gonna give IV therapy, which we're gonna give what? IV wise, fluids, lactated ringers, that's right. We're gonna try and replenish the volume lost. Uh, pain relief can be a cool wet compress, icy water immersion. Um, you can also apply uh, 1 16 thickness of uh, the Silvadine cream. 
electrical burns, uh, maybe more serious than it appears due to electricity availability, uh, electricity ability to travel through tissue and leave and exit wounds. So normally, um, I have personally seen a contractor on the ship that got electrocuted and it like went through his hand, but the exit point was his back and it charred his back about this big. So just because his little finger had this cute little burn to it, his back had this big old charred skin, like third degree burn. It was gnarly. Really Water conducts cool. electricity and the human body's made up of it. It was real cool. I felt bad for the guy at the moment, but it was still really cool. Let's see here. We talked about heat injuries already. Um, the worse the patient is looking, the worse the the severity, right? So always remove the patient, hydrate, cool them down. Like that's about as much as you can do is, you know, you need to start cooling them down as quickly as possible to help bring them back to baseline. Cold injury is going to be the, uh, going to be the opposite of that. So the colder the person gets, the worse they're going to be. So then we got to try and keep them up as fast as we can without causing any issues. So general cooling of the body, uh, shivering, Listlessness, uh, indifference, drowsiness, unconscious, glassy stare in the eyes. Um, we gotta rewarm as, as, as quick as possible. So we can immerse um, in 100 to 105 degree temperature, um, and you're gonna prevent rewarming shock by warming the trunk first. So we're gonna warm our core first before we start hitting our extremities. Uh, immersion flight, keep your feet dry. All right, down and dirty, quick and easy. So, um, do you mind hitting the button for me? So, 